you're listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast, bringing you the knowledge from the people who have it to you, the people who need it. As always, I've got a real special guest for you today, someone who has a wealth of experience, both as a music teacher specializing in piano. You may have noticed a trend. We're getting a couple of great piano players on the podcast and piano teachers on the podcast because the second main theme of our guitar teaching is the music business. And this person is someone who's been very successful in business who I believe has transitioned out of actually teaching into now coaching people. So he's going to be a wealth of advice. And that is Daniel Patterson from Piano Express, Grow Your Music Studio and the Seven Figure Music Teacher Podcast. Daniel, welcome to the Top Music Guitar Podcast. Hey, thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. So it's a real pleasure to have you. I'm a big fan of your show as well. I've listened to about 20 episodes in the last, uh, I guess, two or three months. It's been amazingly insightful for myself uh, and for those of you who don't know, I do have two studios. So once a week, I've got a you know an hour drive one way and an hour drive back. Mm. So it's really easy to get through a couple of episodes and definitely makes the journey a lot more fun. So our listeners, if you do have the ambitions of building a seven-figure music studio, then Daniel is the man to listen to on his seven-figure podcast and his Grow Your Music Studio coaching business as well. So Daniel, can you give us a brief overview of your story so far and your transition from a humble musician straight out of college right up to what you do now? Yeah, for sure. So I started playing piano when I was four years old. I went to university, studied uh, music education with a piano concentration. And immediately upon leaving uh, college, I opened my own studio. I had no idea what I was doing. That was in 2004. And I learned School of Hard Knocks. You know, there were not the online resources that we have now at that time. So I just, like most private teachers do when they're building their own entrepreneurial music studio, I just had to figure it out. And I think the turning point for me was I at one point got a business credit card. I put a bunch of marketing and advertising expenses on it. And I'd been struggling to get students. And I kind of took this risk and got a bunch of students because of it. And there was this dawning realization for this 23, 24 year old that, you know, the music skills aren't enough to get me where I need to go. There's something else I've got to do as well. I need to dive into this skill. And fortunately, I'm a real nerd about it. So I read all the books I could. And I'm going to cut the story short here or just try to shorten it severely. But I'm going to fast forward eight years to 2012, where I kind of discovered Google ads. I mean, I known it had been around, but I never really considered it as an option. And I really threw myself in the Google ads platform, something that wasn't really being talked about and had incredible success with that. Like doubled my income in 18 months, went into six-figure territory. Meanwhile, I was able to do that because I was teaching groups in my private studio. And then in 2015, I had just buried my head in digital marketing materials for three years, took tons of courses, had been coached by people. And I thought, I I just want to start writing about this. So I started a blog called Grow Your Music Studio. You can find that at growyourmusicstudio.com. And the rest is kind of history. The blogs were really well received. And over time, people started coming to me and saying, hey, can you show me how to do what you do? And that's where that journey began. And that's what I've been doing for the last seven years. Yeah, fantastic. And it's my understanding you've transitioned out of teaching and running the business side of things. And you're now focusing entirely on on the, the coaching side of things. Is that correct? Yeah. So I didn't plan this, but I made a decision with my business coach that I was going to stop teaching. And I decided to do that on December 5th of 2019. I mean, well, technically, I made the decision a few months before, but that's that was my last day of teaching. And then three months later, the world shut down. And it was very fortuitous timing. I didn't, I swear you guys, I didn't have any tip off. I didn't know (laughs) that that was coming. But part of the reason for doing that was that I really felt stretched at both ends. I had all these students and then just 
from in 2018, 2019, because I'd really ramped my marketing efforts up at Gary Music Studio, I just had more clients than I knew what to do with. And I had to make a choice because I was working crazy hours. And so, you know, I made I made the tough choice. And and that's that's kind of how I got it's kind of how I ended the studio. Fantastic. And that's why we see like a really big decision. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is sometimes you gotta give up to go up. And obviously you had the the choice of, well, I've got this wonderful thing which has been providing with me for so many years, but yeah, do I give that up and move on to another thing? So how did you know or what sort of mm. encouraged you to give up something which I, I assume was a really profitable business that was working really well and, and go and transition to something which potentially was going to do just as well, if not better. But how do you give up that thing which you know is a safe mm. option or a good bet for something which, you know, is is unproven? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I mean, obviously it was germane to me at the time. And I think it's germane to everyone listening simply because we all have choices we have to make in our business, whether it's adding another program. Should I start this teacher? Should I try to go to group lessons? Like there's these choices that you have to make in the face of uncertainty. And for me at that time, I wouldn't say it was an easy decision in one respect, but it was very easy in other respects. It was this, that I was very satisfied with where my, where my teaching was. I'm a person who needs a challenge. I get bored if I don't have one. And in terms of the teaching, I had fulfilled a lot of the teaching goals that I had. There were these insecurities and deficiencies that I had, as we all do as teachers, in the early part of my career. And man, I wish I could get students to do that. I wish I could put students in that program and they get this kind of score. And I couldn't do that earlier in my career. But through the 2010s, one by one, all of these milestones, all these goals that I had in terms of my teaching, I just started knocking them down one by one. Did that, did that, did that. And I got to this place where I really didn't have any mountain left to climb. And I suppose I could have made new goals, but because Gurry Music Studio had been doing so well for the past four years, my the goals were more on the business side of things. And so the thing that kept me in the studio for the last year and a half was the relationships. It was the kids. You know, here's this kid that I started at age four. Now she's 14. She's a great pianist. There was this pang of like conscience of, oh man, how do I, how do I leave these kids behind? But Again, going back to what I said before, there was this also there was also this aspect of it that I was working a ton and I just had to stop. And so I know those circumstances are unique to my life, but that's how that's how I made that decision. I'm sure that folks, if they have a big decision that they they have in their mind, like that's how I think you kind of know. You just eventually your body tells you, or your gut tells you, or your mind tells you, or just your exhaustion tells you. It's time to make a change. Yeah, most definitely. And I think a lot of teachers do end up burning out or making decisions because they want to please everyone or or stick mm. with it for certain students. And I definitely know in my experience, my sat days were ruled by, you know, a, a seven or eight year old client who I'd had from age four who, you know, had just turned twelve or so. And they literally had that sat day time slot, the whole timetable. And my my weekends were based on keeping this one client happy who'd been with me from, you know, mm. a, a long time. And you know, I th think that guilt's a real thing, but at the end of the day, sometimes you know, we can't keep everyone happy, so we may as well make ourselves happy. Yeah, hundred percent. It's so hard to say no to people sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you sell the business, or are you still owning that, in, or you know, controlling it to some capacity? Yeah, you know, so I had my private studio was run out of my home, and you know, at its peak, I had a hundred students coming to my house every week. Again, since I was teaching group lessons. And then in 2018, as my workload went up, I did stop enrolling new students. So attrition brought the numbers down naturally over time, um, you know, anywhere from someone moving away to just the typical, hey, we don't want to do this anymore, to kids graduating, that sort of thing. So because it was a very boutique business, it wasn't something I ever considered selling. It was something I literally just shut down. But, you know, you made a comment earlier, and I just maybe go back and address that a little bit, that... For me, it didn't feel like a big risk at the time because I basically had two businesses that on their own would be considered more than a full-time income. And so it was a situation where I was just shutting down one income stream to get the time back that I knew if I could invest that in just one business, that that would make that grow even more. So I thought I'd just kind of address that, that it wasn't like I took this risky decision. I made this risky decision. It wasn't like that at all. It was a very calculated decision and one that I thought about and even talked to my business coach about. Yeah. And I'm sure you had the data and the numbers to go, hmm, this is oh, at yeah. this point and this is at this point. So if I just make the switch, if I jump ship here, it's going to be 
get this one on the rise. If not, it may have even been higher at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anything, I waited too long, to be honest. That's what my coach told me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I think I just want to point out to our listeners, the fact that Daniel was obviously very successful and he's talking about a coach and having other people to bounce ideas off or get more guidance from. So if there's one thing you can do is invest in yourself, whether that's, you know, with a coach, it could be going to Daniel and his program. It could be coming to me in my six figure program. Top music itself has, you know, at a basic level, we've got courses which you can watch and learn from as part of educating yourself, or you can reach out for that one-on-one -on -one coaching. So how uh, important has coaching and guidance and having a mentor been for you across your journey? Very important. I think I put things into two categories. I think there's the information you have to have to know what to do, but information, and this is almost a cliche now, it's like an Instagram quote almost, like information is abundant now. What scarce is, is wisdom or the will to act or the kinds of things that help propel a person forward. And so for me, there were blind spots I had as an entrepreneur. There was blind spots I had as a human. And I hired a coach for the first time in 2014. But then the one that I worked with for a long time, I hired in 2016, a different guy. And I went in thinking like, you know, I'm going to tell him the goal. And then somehow he's going to teach me something about business I don't already know that's going to help me get to that financial goal. And what I got from him was very, very different because he started calling out all these fears that I had. He started calling out all these what he called and what a lot of people call competing commitments. Daniel, you say you want this, but then you're doing this action over here. Those two things don't align. Can you explain that to me? And he was kind about it, but he just kept pointing out all these things. And then we started working around a lot of issues I had around money. Um, and we rooted some of those things out of my life, which had been planted there at a very young age because of my upbringing. And so the, the coaching experience that I got was very, very different than what I thought it was going to be. And, and then I was so floored with even in a six month time period, how much it had helped me that I kind of put my plans on hold in terms of what my goals had been for Gary Music Studio in like 2016. And I just said, hey, I want you to show me how to do what you're doing to me. <laughs> like, what is this voodoo, this magic that you're performing on me that I don't understand, but I just come and talk to you and then things get better in my life. Like, can you show me how to do that? And so I spent the better part of a year just learning how to coach, so to speak, in this, this deeper, more substantial way, or at least what I judge to be more substantial. And then I started bringing that to my clients. And, and then I think it started bleeding over into the courses and the trainings that I was creating. And um, it must be working because people keep coming back. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of my experience with coaching and, and I've, you know, I worked with him for quite a long time. And then even in the midst of that, I worked with some other folks around other topics. I have gone to business coaches where it is more of a knowledge thing, not like a deep, deeper inner work type thing. I, I've used all kinds of coaches, but I firmly believe in it. Very much believe in it. Yeah. Fantastic. And I just want to go back a little bit to when you said they kind of like point things out in inconsistencies. I think sometimes a good coach will tell you what not to do as opposed mm -hmm. to there's a million different things, you know, in, in yes. business, like, you know, you could do Facebook ads, Google ads, email marketing, build up Instagram following, do TikTok because that's trending now. There's so many things. And if you're trying to build your business or especially on the back of COVID, so many people have gone into, uh, you know, working from home or online teaching or training and things like that, that they're just trying to do everything and they don't really get anywhere. They make, you know, 10% progress, not working, go to the next thing, 10% progress, not doing the next thing. So having that coach to sort of get you in alignment or to tell you what to do and what not to do, as opposed to just try everything. I believe that can be a lot or very helpful to most of our listeners. Mm, I completely agree. And I might just add this, maybe two thoughts. A good coach will answer your questions. An excellent coach will help you ask better ones. And then the other thing I would say is that the thing that I've noticed about the coaches who've been most impactful for me is how little they talk and how little they give me advice. It, it's about the questions they're asking me. And they get very, very familiar with the way that I'm thinking. And it, it's just remarkable, like the difference that understanding and truly deeply listening to the client will do. And I've just felt so heard. And then what happens is, is that because they're so intimately familiar with the way I'm thinking and the way my business is running, like what they tell me is very pointed, very specific. And there's a lot of no in there, like you were saying. Yeah, that's a good point. Fantastic. And a really good insight there in terms of, I'm sure there's a couple of people listening to this who do some form of coaching or may look into it, or mm. that's part of their online business. So to actually get that advice in terms of, you know, talk less, listen more, and just mm. help the client feel heard, but then help them 
get from where they're going or make that ask the right question. I think one of my early mentors used to say the quality of your outcome is determined by the quality of your question. So to be able to, mm. and that ties into, you know, the whole teach a man to fish versus, uh, you know, give a man oh, a fish yeah. or teach a man to fish. If you can get people thinking in the right way, whether that's your coaching clients or your students, that can be really, really important. I think in my own teaching at Melbourne Guitar Academy, the thing that sets me apart from most teachers is I don't tell you what you need to learn or tell you what to practice. I show you what to practice or I show you how you can take one instance of learning and apply it to any instance of learning. So we're creating independent thinkers, independent learners, rather than just people who mimic music like a parrot. Mm. Uh, but I would love to ask you just a little bit more about the whole, you know, online landscape. You've obviously started 2017, 2018. Did you say you, you started doing the blog? Very late 2015, actually. 2017, 2018 was where it really started taking off. Um, but yeah, so the online landscape, there's a lot that we could talk about there. Is there anything in particular you were thinking of? Yeah, well, I think there's just so much content. There's so much saturation, uh, as we sort of alluded to before, is there's so many things you could do, so much advice. Uh, you've obviously started around 2015 blogging and, and implementing things, but I've noticed, especially on the back of COVID, people were sort of going, okay, I can't teach anymore. Let's take an online course about making money. And the online course mm. is you create an online course to make some money. And then now there's, there's a kind of pyramid scheme of, of, of half qualified people or semi qualified people or people that literally just aren't doing what they've ever done in their own business, you know, trying to mm. coach other people. So at what point did you feel like your success was warranted to start coaching? And, you know, is that the right way to go about that question? Because you've sort of grown into it and had people approach you. So at what point did you go, okay, I feel like I'm qualified to be helping other people in their business? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, unlike getting a degree in piano from a university, you have no qualification to be a coach. <laughs> And in some cases, getting a degree in piano from university might not qualify to be a teacher either, you know? Um, so I think for me, it was that, I mean, I am a teacher at heart. And so I had done a lot of, let's call them side hustles, even from very early on when I, when my studio wasn't as large as it was, there was always that kind of entrepreneurial spirit for me. I had an eBay store at one point. I was drop shipping um, products in from China at one point, like nothing to do with music. It was just things I was doing in my spare time because I was interested in it. And what I found as I was learning to do those things was that if I brought those techniques back to my music school, it was like bringing this overpowered technique or tactic back to something that didn't need it. You know, in, in the movie Indiana Jones, there's this uh, scene, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of Lost Ark, there's a scene where this guy gets a sword out and is like threatening Indiana. And he just, I hate to say it. He gets a gun out and shoots the guy. Like it's like bringing a gun to a sword fight. Yeah. And so there were all these really overpowered techniques that I was learning to do these side hustles I was doing. I was like, well, what if I tried them on my studio? And I just started experimenting on it. And I went from wondering if the phone would ring or if I'd get an email or if someone would fill out the form, my contact to on a very, very low budget, I was getting like 200 requests for lessons a year on like less than 2000 American dollars. That's really, really low. And so then it was a situation where I was just enjoying the fruits of my labor when it came to that. And then I thought, you know, I'm trying to do all these side hustles and all these other areas online that really have nothing to do with what I'm passionate about and what my career is in. What if I just started teaching people to do this stuff? And so I started and, and um, Scout's Honor, I had no intention when I first began. Well, I did have an intention of turning it into a business. But I started without a course or an offer, which is like rule, that's like rule number one. You have, you have to have something to sell. I just decided to start without something to sell because I thought, let's see if people are even open to hearing this. And so I just started teaching and, and literally had no sales page. I had no offer. I, I didn't even have an, um, like a follow-up email sequence. I think I had one email in my email sequence for like the first five years the business was open. And the way that I got validation was just people kept coming to me and saying, how do I pay you to teach me to do this stuff? So it was truly market demand that, that kind of propelled this to, a, you know, at this point, a very large business and a couple other businesses that have branched off from it. So I would just say that there's a embarrassment of riches in terms of support that's available to music school owners now. There's really no reason that a school owner has to struggle. There's no reason that even a private studio owner has to struggle, like in terms of getting students or getting support or helping improve 
their systems or their policies or their teaching. There, there's so much like, and you know, some of the early people were like Joy Morin and Tim Topham, you know, like some of these things have been around for a decade. I think the problem, the challenge now is there is so much choice that it might be hard to know who to follow, but, or, or whose advice to take. I follow a lot of accounts on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, like in terms of music school or music studio growth advice and stuff comes across my feet every day that I think is actually bad advice. I don't ever call it out. I'm not trying to pick fights or anything. What I would say is that I think what's true now is what was true a decade ago. And that is, you just have to be committed to the process. You just have to have a learner's mind. And a learner's mind a decade ago might have meant forging your own pathway because there weren't a lot of resources out there. A learner's mind now looks like looking at a lot of the options that you have available, um, asking around, asking friends who they trusted, asking friends um, experiences they had in this program or that program. And I think over time, you're going to get a sense of the landscape that's out there and who's trustworthy and who's not. Of course, I'm just going to say it here, like anything top music does, I'm totally on board with a lot of clients that have worked with me in different ways to also have a membership, you know, to some of the top music programs. Like there's a quality that stands the test of time. Tim's been at this over 10 years. And I would just say that if someone has been around for a while, for the most part, it shows that something's going right there. It isn't always true, but most of the time it is. So I don't know how helpful that is, but that's kind of been my experience. And and the advice I take for myself when I'm evaluating, because I still I still invest in learning experiences myself. I haven't stopped learning either. And I think that's a really important point to highlight is the people who are at the top generally continuously invest into themselves as opposed to getting to a certain point and just going, yep, I'm done now or I know everything and and not being able to further progress or further help people. Yeah, yeah. Now, one last little question I do want to ask on this topic before we sort of move on. I'm obviously the six-figure guitar teacher guy. You're the seven-figure music school guy. Oh, no. I wasn't trying to compete, I promise. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. But you actually, for those of you listening and some of my listeners know some of the new guys, every now and then this pops up, I do send my questions ahead of time. And we just had a bit of a chat and Daniel said, oh, I don't really think the audience may potentially be interested in this because of my experience. I think people like these topics and this topic, you know, you and I can have a great conversation with, but the the market is small. So one thing I've definitely found with guitar teachers is they're musicians at heart. They're not really mm-hmm. interested in in business. And for me, it's a bit of a hard sell going, everyone comes to me and goes, oh man, I'd love to make a hundred thousand dollars, but 80% of people think it's impossible. And out of the mm-hmm. 18% remaining or whatever, uh, they go, no, it's too good to be true. It's a scam it's not going to work. So as much as I'd love to keep on asking these big money figures, sometimes we've got to get people to the point where, you know, they get the small victories and they switch their mindset over. But one thing that I always wrestle with is, is it better to run a six figure or multiple six figure, uh, one person operation or, or, you know, one one or two teachers and, uh, and an admin kind of thing and have a really profitable multi six figure studio, or are you going to try and scale your business up to a million dollars get the seven figures, but, you know, work 60 hours a week and employ and get everyone else paid and you yourself as the owner get the crumb. So you know, I've always gone, you know what, I'm making, I had a couple of really good years early on where I probably did, I think $250,000 as a solo mm. teacher one year uh, all by myself. And that was really nice to take home 180 grand at the end of the day. And then there's been times where, especially like COVID where all the teachers got paid and there was just like, couple of crumbs <laughs> left over at the mm. end of the, the day. And I'm going, man, I don't know why I'm growing to this seven figure business when it was just so much easier being a solo operation and not having the headaches of this person's called in sick or, you know, now I've got to drive to the other side of town to cover this and all the headaches that go with being a business owner. So in the topic of potentially bad advice, you know, building a seven figure studio as opposed to just doing a solo operation, what's your sort of thoughts there and how do you decide what to do and and where to go in that direction. Okay. It's a good question. There are several thoughts that immediately come to mind. And and one, the first one is this kind of is a combination of what we were just talking about and what you're asking now. And that is the best advice I can give someone is to get really clear on what it is they actually want. Because a lot of times when someone has, what I found in talking to a lot of coaching clients is that someone has substituted one thing for the thing they really want. 
So what they really want is this, and the, the way they think they're going to get it is by building this. I've talked to a lot of people out of scaling up their studio because once I really drilled down and, again, asked those right questions, I found out what they really wanted, and we talked about all the ways that they could get it, and then they felt empowered to get it in a way that maybe that they would regret five years on. I do know school owners that regret scaling up, and I help them scale down but still maintain the amount of money that they had. So that's the first way I answer that. The second thing I would say is that for me, I looked at a few people I knew that were farther on in the journey of building a commercial school, you know, commercial location, teachers, different risk profile, having to worry about things like, you know, zoning laws, like all that stuff. Okay. And they were farther on the journey. I mean, I looked at their pathway and I thought, okay, well, if that's what it takes to get to this amount of money, then I guess that's the way I got to go too. But then I started doing some math and I thought, well, what if I were able to just teach? Because, you know, in the back of my mind was this idea of group lessons, although in the 2000s, this is not nearly as big a topic as it is now. Again, also because there weren't as many resources then. But in the back of my mind, group lessons, well, if I could just teach this many kids, I could get to X dollars. And I'm going to fast forward the story. If you want to dive into it, I'm happy to do it. But I'm just going to cut to the end of the story. Uh, Spoiler alert. Basically, after five years of really trying to make that work, I was taking home more than people I knew that had a multi-hundred kid school because I was doing lessons in this format. And that's why I go back to what I said at the beginning, get clear on what it is you actually wanted. I didn't actually want to run a school. I just wanted to make the money. And and honestly, on top of that, I didn't want to have to manage people. And I enjoyed the the face-to-face contact with with the kids and and goofing around with them and joking around and, and seeing them progress and, and those sorts of things. So it's like, here's all these things I wanted. Here's all these things I really wanted. And I figured out, well, then This greatly narrowed the number of paths I could take to get to that and have all those things be true. And so that's why I ran a hundred kids school or studio out of my front room of my house, fairly large room, a lot of pianos in it. And basically lived the life that I absolutely wanted to live. And so just to, to bring it all full circle and answer the question, I think that I think the choice that someone would make as to whether they want to scale to six figures or multiple six figures or even to seven, understand that there are things that you're gonna have to do along the way. And you need to be really comfortable with the kinds of things that the business you're saying you wanna build is going to demand of you and ask of you. You've gotta be, you've gotta understand that and you've gotta be really fine with building that thing. That's what I'd say. That's how you make that decision. That's some really, really solid advice. And uh, oh, there's so many things that came out of that, sir. So. I'm going to have to go rewatch this and then <laughs> formulate my own <laughs> hypothetical responses based on what you just said, because I think that was all fantastic stuff. But I think a lot of people, as you've said, they sort of, they want one thing and they go chasing the wrong way of getting about it, not realizing there's other ways to go around it. And if the, the goal was to create a life where you could work 20 hours and play music 20 hours or have that time with your family, then yeah, you want the money to, pr- to allow to do for that. But if you have to work 60 hours to get the money, then it defeats the purpose of going out and doing it in the first place. Yeah, agreed. And I, again, I think I, I have to say it, it goes back to that thing we were talking about earlier, which was the thing that most prevents, from my observation, I, from my observation, the thing that prevents people from getting to what they want is they don't think they can get it or they only see one pathway to get it or they look at what others have done and just said, well, that's what I've got to do too. And then you have a whole industry of people doing the same thing. And that might work for some folks, but it might make other people really unhappy. And so for me, it was just deciding that I was going to be, that I was going to make this group thing work no matter what. There was true commitment to it. I kind of invented for myself a way of group teaching that there really was no resources or training or books or curriculums out there that could let me do the thing that I wanted to do. So I just had to make it up. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that they have that power. And again, going back to the coaching conversation, that's what a good coach can help you do is see those blind spots, see those limiting beliefs, and help you understand that you have that power and then equip you with the skills necessary to get there. 
Fantastic. Now, I could keep talking about the business side of things all day, but you are renowned as one of the the group guitar guys who sort of brought it to the foray. And I guess, like, retrospectively, you may have even been one of the people who have influenced this kind of popular, you know, rising because you're coaching other people to do it and that's seeped down. But group lessons are definitely trending at the moment. I know our top music topic of the month, I guess this episode is probably going to come out about eight weeks after uh what we're recording right now, but the theme mm. of top music is group lessons at the moment, group guitar teaching, mm. group piano teaching. And I yeah. think a lot of people are starting to see that it works and show a bit more interest in it. So I do want to ask you about group lessons and some more things uh, along that topic. Yeah, for so sure. one thing I've always noticed in my studio is sometimes group lessons can be amazingly powerful with some people, uh, but then there's other people who they always come with this preconceived notion of private lessons being better. I think that's a pretty sure. universal thing. And it's oh, always yeah. been, it's just the way it's always been taught and people just think it's the best. How do you sort of communicate to someone who only wants private lessons that know we do groups and, and it's going to be a much better approach to you? How do you sort of change their mind or influence them or, or get them to give it a go? Yeah. So for me, it was connected to how I did my marketing. And because my marketing was digital in nature and I was mostly interacting with people who'd never heard of me before, they just did a Google search and they found me. The front end marketing for my site was very much in line with really good direct advertising methods. Like, again, nerd, I spent a ton of time like learning copywriting and, and all these sorts of things. A piece of advice I kept showing up that kept showing up in like every course I took on persuasive writing, every course I took on sales, every book I read on copywriting or how to be persuasive in print. There were a few ideas that kept showing up everywhere. And one of those ideas was focus on outcomes. Don't focus on how amazing, you know, the tires on this car you're trying to sell is focus on what it will do for the person. That's a little cliche. I know it's not in the music field. How does that apply in the music field? Well, it actually goes directly to the objection that most parents have, or if it's an adult student, what an adult student, the objection an adult student might have if it comes to group lessons, which is, oh, well, I want to be in a one-on-one -on -one lesson, not a group. Well, what they're focusing on is the format. They're focusing on, they don't realize it, but they're focusing on what might be one of the least important aspects of their learning experience. And it's based in fear. Oh, I'm not going to get a good deal, or it won't be as effective, or it's going to be a waste of my time. But they're not qualified to make that judgment call. I am. So what I have to do is help them see what I know to be true. And so all the front end marketing that I did, whether it was Google ads or whether it was my website or you know a, a social post on Facebook, focused on outcomes that kids were getting in my studio because I was a kids only studio. I didn't teach adults after a certain point. And so people would come in or come into my marketing funnel and all they'd see is like all this focus on outcomes, outcome language, outcome language, outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. They'd reach out to me because it seemed really good. And even at that level of first talking to them, I really wouldn't talk about the formatting. We would get basically to the point where they're ready to sign up. And that's where I began to talk about formatting. And by that point, we had forged a relationship. I had talked about, oh, because you know, again, they're much more committed now. If they're on the phone with me and then they come or trading emails with me and then they decide to come in for a trial lesson or an open house, they're way more committed at the point that they're in there and meeting with me and talking with me, seeing my energy, seeing how I'm interacting with their child, seeing how the child's learning like five songs in the space of 10 minutes, having never played the instrument before. There's a level of trust and a deepening of the relationship that makes it much easier for them to accept that this guy knows what he's doing. And then when I talk and then how I presented, which we probably don't have the time to get into this, but I had like a whole spiel that I, that I would say to people and I would explain how things in my studio worked. And again, it wasn't like, here's my policies. Here's the books I use. It, it was all outcomes again. Um, it's stories, which are anecdotal, but feel real to people, feel more real than data sometimes. Uh, I had just the perfect stories that I tested over years. I told them almost the same way for every single person that came into my studio. And so by the time it got to the point where I talked about my accelerated program, they were never going to say no. And honestly, in 10 years, I only had one family tell me no. And it wasn't even a family that was considering group lessons. Um, it was a family that had a more advanced student and they were 
choosing to either work with me or a professor at a local university here. And they ended up going with the professor. In 10 years, I never had anyone turn me down after they'd come into the studio. And it, I think it just goes to show that that outcome-based language, focusing people on the result, the result, the result, and helping them imagine their child getting the result is like 80% of the reason why I really didn't deal with arguments around the group lesson format after a certain point. Because if you remember earlier in this interview, I said that it took me about five years to convert to group. It's because I made every mistake in the book. And it was only <laughs> after I learned like that outcomes-based thinking and then learned how to do it and then learn how to do it well, that it became much easier to convert over. I, I, my conversion process was actually very slow, painfully slow. But the people I've worked with and helped convert to group have not taken nearly as long. I've had people convert to an entire studio of over 100 kids to group in like 17 days going through my group lesson training. But that's a story for another time. Definitely. Oh, there's some really, really great insightful answers there. And I think our listeners could do really well to jot a few of those ideas down. And continuing on the topic of group lessons, I think this is one that I did actually send forward, but how do you actually make your, uh, your group lessons better than your competitors' private lessons? Yeah. How do you, how do you get the results? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to say, yep, I'm teaching group lessons and they're better. And for this reason, but how do you actually deliver on that fact? Yeah. I think we're gonna have to stick to high level ideas there. Um, so first off, I think someone has to be really clear on what their educational objectives were. For me, I, I would measure success in a way that parents would measure success. How often am I arguing with my kid over practice? And does it sound like they're getting better? Like I knew that that was as sophisticated as parents were. And so that became my target. Okay, well, how do I help them get better in an age that's increasingly filled with distraction and a thousand channels on TV, Disney Plus, Fortnite, Instagram, TikTok, Roblox, like there's all these things that kids could be doing as opposed to learning a skill that they can take for them their entire life. And the parent sees that. And so for me, the way that I delivered results was I just kept them in my studio longer. And I don't mean retention. I mean, they came for an hour each week. And instead of focusing on cramming knowledge into their head, those hours with me were really more of a lab session. And, and this is really important to, to answering the question. Like this is very germane to your question. Those first six months were probably the most important six months in the entire student's career. I mentioned that, that girl that I taught from age four to age 14. The most important time was those first six months because what I chose to focus on the first six months probably looks a lot like what a lot of other teachers were doing. It's just the way that I went about doing it was different. I focused helping those kids understand that, that they had to do this on their own. This is something I've said quite often in content I've made on group lessons, but I think it bears repeating. And that is you cannot separate the results that you get the educational result that you get with a child from the environment in which they get that result. Group lessons and private lessons are not equal. Private lessons is a very, is a one-on-one -on -one experience and kids, kids realize you have their undivided attention and there is a learned helplessness that shows up in children when you're with them in a one-on-one -on -one environment. This is what I, I observed over the years just in my own teaching. And the way I know this is that I took kids that had only been in group with me. And I might've had like every once in a while, if I might have a one-on-one -on -one session with them, like if I'm prepping them for a recital or if I'm prepping them for an exam, you know, I know in Australia, you have AMEB, we have RCM over here in North America. So I'm prepping this kid for exam. They need just a little bit extra help. So, you know, just for a student, that maybe is a little bit higher level. I just offered an extra session with them. Mom brings her in. Mom's sitting in the lesson with me and this 10 year old and the 10 year old's not acting like they're acting in the group. They're acting like they've got this helplessness about them. They've got this insecurity. They're a little more awkward than they are because they they feel the, the attention that they're getting from me. So just magnify that over a five-year period. Who does that student become? Well, they become someone who feels dependent on the teacher. And what I broke kids of in their first couple weeks in the studio was thinking that I was going to help them. I didn't help them. It, like... <laughs> um, Kids learn very quickly that I had a sense of humor and that I talked to them in a way that was probably different than a lot of other authority figures in their life. And so if a child said to me, like, I don't know how to do this, I was like, actually, I don't believe you. You can get this on your own. Where does your finger go? What does it say right there in the book? Can you read numbers? And, you know, this kid's like looking at me. And by the way, I'm not being rude about it. 
about it, okay? I'm not being rude about it. I'm being I'm being a little blunt here. It'd be a little bit more goofy if I was talking with a child, you know? And they just began to realize that they had to get this on their own. And usually within a matter of four to six weeks, these kids, every other learning environment in their life, they can get away with that. They're not getting away with it here. And so because we're now cooperating together, they can move so much faster. And then when you combine that with the fact that they're practicing with me for an hour a week, this is why they would just, in the early days when I still had not converted all my one-on-ones over because I was terrible at converting people to group, I could see two kids start the same week, maybe same age, similar personalities even, similar uh, learning speeds. And that group kid would be so much farther ahead than that one-on-one kid after six months. It had to do with the environment, what I was doing with them, what I had time to do. Yeah. So I know that's a little bit of a drawn out, drawn out answer, but that's kind of the high level overview. Now, how I actually delivered that result, if we had six hours, I could tell you that, but that gets a little more technical. How did I actually do that with the kids? I had a lot of techniques. I had a lot of things. A lot of those early lessons with those kids were almost scripted. Like I would say the same thing to every child. It was a system to me. It was a factory that was turning out kids who could score well in exams. Meanwhile, having fun and it being a goofy environment where kids did not feel fear and it felt casual to them. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. But And it took me a while to kind of understand the chemistry of it all. But again, like I said in the early part of this episode, I just wasn't going to take no for an answer. You know, I I, I was going to figure this thing out whether, whether I died trying or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, a really good perspective. And even at the start, I just want to point out to the listeners – you began your response by presenting a really high quality question in terms of how do I do this and this and this? Mm-hmm. And then it's obviously resulted in one of the most profound, well thought out, methodical and strategic approaches to educating the parents on the process, which leads to the outcome mm-hmm. on giving the kids a very different approach and almost teaching them how to independently become musicians. Cause ultimately I think that's, something I reflect upon a lot is what's the difference between these people who become really good at guitar, whether that's initially or over the long period of time, and the people that don't. The people that become good at guitar or whatever the instrument is are the people who are proactive in doing it at home. They're the ones that practice. Mm -hmm. They adopt the behaviors of guitar players or musicians. They're regularly practicing. They're reading things uh, about their craft or uh, they're actively listening to music. They're going out and doing these things. But the most important thing at the end of the day, if they don't practice their instrument, nothing's going to happen. So it's very interesting to hear your take on it. And that is just so much deeper than, you know, what most people do or think or go about. Well, I I do have a little bit of unfair advantage because I've been talking about this for so to a lot of people over the last seven years. So what's interesting is that when I first started the first group of like 12 piano teachers that I showed how to do group the way that I was doing it, I realized that I couldn't verbalize what I was doing. Like I actually had to come up with the language to describe what I was doing because it was all intuitive for me at that point. I've been doing it about eight years. And in the making of that training, like I actually had to, I codified these rules that I'd been operating by. But now, and you know, not to pat myself the back or anything, but I've helped over 500 studios convert to group lessons at this point. So at this point, like I've talked about this so much and taught so many people that, it, you know, I've had a long time to, to really think these answers out. And um so, like I said, I have a little bit of an unfair advantage. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And obviously, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You've done it successfully yourself. You've helped with other people. If you're not teaching group lessons, at least to some capacity, and ultimately, I believe not every single person suits groups. Um, every now and then you get someone who does need that one-on-one attention. But sometimes you can you can have groups and you can have people doing, you know, private lessons. One thing I, I say to guitar teachers is, in my program is, yeah, you definitely need a group program because that's your bread and butter and that's going to, be what makes you income, but there's nothing wrong with having Mm -hmm. hand selected students for something extra or including a a once a month private, or, you know, you could make a lot more money if you had people doing a regular group and you just added in, you know, an extra $50 a month and they come in and do a one-on-one session with you provided, you know, you've got the time and and you wanted to do that thing. But on the topic of group lessons, continuing, um, this is going to be slightly different to one that I pitched to you, but a lot of people think, oh no, the question just gone out of my head there. (laughs) Well, let me just gather my thoughts and man, it's just so awesome. I do, just want to pause here and say thank you so much for coming on the podcast because I'm learning so oh, much sure. for myself. I know my <laughs> listeners are and I know it's a good interview when the cogs are just spinning and my brain is just thinking mm. of a million different things and I can't wait to jump off this call and start implementing everything that I've learned myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really it's a really funny scenario to be in my head at the moment. Um, 
it was something about the groups versus the private lessons. It's going to drive me absolutely crazy in terms of not getting this happens. answer to you. <laughs> it's gone. I will, I will have to message you on and say, if I think of what this question was, I'll have to email it to you because I don't want to okay. push on uh, too much longer. I know we're, we're wrapping up and I really do appreciate your time and, and value it. Oh, well, no worry. Yeah, we in can terms go, of, yeah, we can go longer for sure. Um, uh, and guys, I think we're definitely going to have to get Daniel back. If you want to get Daniel back, make sure you post on social media. Go out and check out uh, Daniel uh, and where he's at with everything and pester him to come back on the show if you like the episode, which I'm nice. sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you, I mean, all, the answer you've given me has just been so insightful that it almost answers every other question I was going <laughs> to going to ask. And that's kind of why I've, mm. I've been absolutely stumped here because it's just like, well, everything's been touched upon. But in terms of building that relationship with your students, how do you go about mm. building relationships in a group scenario when you don't have that one-on-one -on -one time as you normally would? Mm. So for me, I think it's connected to the way that I did groups. And that is, I taught a multi-level group system. So I did not have kids by level or by age. Just everyone got thrown in and I did what I had to do. And it's been described to me, although I think this vastly underrepresents what I was doing, but someone heard a description of how I, you know, described what I was doing in my teaching environment. They said, oh, you're teaching many lessons to each child. Yeah, that's fair. I think we could say that's true. So what's that, in, what's that entail for me? That involves me like evaluating the child's performance. It might entail me teaching a concept to a child right by their piano while everyone else is kind of working on their thing. That isn't actually all that unlike a one-on-one -on -one lesson. So there's the opportunity there for me to build relationship, understand who, what this child's personality is, understand whether I need to tone myself down or if this child, like, if I can see they'll have a better experience of the lessons, if I'm acting a little goofier. And so for me, I learned who each child was. And then just through us working together and them being able to f show up and be fully present because they're not, they don't feel small. They don't feel diminished. They, they're empowered. Those personalities really came out. And I don't feel that being in a group environment and seeing five kids at a time kept me from having the same kind of contact that I would have had with those kids had it just been one-on-one. -on -one. Because even in the one-on-one -on -one environment, I wouldn't just sit there and chat with a, with a student for five minutes. <laughs> you know, I, I don't believe that the, that the lesson is there for the aggrandizement of the teacher or for their own, you know, it's not for the teacher, it's for the student. So I'm going to show up and do what I need to do to fulfill my roles ethically to the parents and to fulfill my role as a teacher to the student. So I would say that I had about the same level of camaraderie with the students, but probably better because then students in the group environment knew that they could just talk to me. They um, Sometimes I would just interrupt everybody and just tell a joke, had nothing to do with what anyone was doing, and it just lightened the mood of the room. So all of that stuff, I had students say, I'll never forget the time that you just started singing this stupid song. Like it was a song that I heard on the American sitcom 30 Rock. And just it caused uproarious laughter in, in there. And students talked about that years later. So I, I think it's um I think it's a boogeyman, honestly, that teachers tell themselves like, oh, I could never do group because then I'll lose these relationships I have with the student. It's just not true. I think it's just something we tell ourselves to stop ourselves from doing the thing we know we should be doing. Yeah, and just a band-aid you need to rip off. Just <laughs> yeah. get rid of the yeah. excuses, rip it off and, and straight into it. All right. Well, Daniel, I do appreciate your time. I've got one more question for you. And fortunately, I remembered back to what I was going to do. So anyone watching the oh, video, nice. you, you probably see that I'm deep in thought while Daniel's giving his answer, trying to you know keep one ear on Daniel and one inner ear thinking things. And the cogs spin and I go, yeah, I get excited and I write it down. So funny little thing <laughs> for the, the people who watch the video when it comes out versus the people listening at home. My question is about the practice expectations. So mm. some advice and some coaches say, why don't we just get rid of the practice expectations? Because as, as you mentioned, it's kind of like the metric. It's the thing that parents can visually see yeah. and you know, the ease at which they can convince their kids to practice or how, how many fights go on is obviously their measurement. So one camp is, do we just remove the expectation? You come to your lesson, that's where the learning takes place. And this is what happens at sport. You don't have to train at home. You just come to the training session there. And that's where you learn. And if you don't practice at home, who cares? And the other is what you've done where we need to establish this habit of practice so that the parents can see it and, and build from there. So is there merit to both ideas? Is one better than the other? How would you go about setting up A versus B or a combination of both? I can tell you what I did. 
And, and then I can also objectively talk about the two approaches, but just to talk about what I did, because of the kind of studio that I was trying to present, my choice was to not put any expectation on practice because I thought, and this was really one of the most core beliefs I had was a core value of the studio. Kids will do something that feels fun and kids will do something that feels easy because fun is easy to a child. It's effortless. If it's effortless, they'll do it without a lot of grumbling. Honestly, if you just get them into the habit, they'll do it if it feels effortless. So for me, I took responsibility for the practice problem. And so I thought if I can make these kids independent and send them home, especially in their first three, six, nine months of lessons with all their songs already learned, it won't be an issue for them to go and play something they already know how to do. So I can build this habit at the beginning. And then it's on me to make sure that the music stays easy. But given the approach that I had, it was and making these students independent learners I had kids that would go pretty far without hitting kind of the typical roadblocks that a lot of a lot of kids run into. Uh, so I guess really the point I'm getting at is that my choice was to have uh, was to not pressure parents to 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 pressure their kids at home to practice. And inevitably, I would see parents, you know, oh well, you know, Sarah didn't practice this week. I would see parents like trying to use that like shaming language or guilting language with their own kids, like in front of me, like, oh, the teacher's going to get on my side and they're going to shame Sarah too for not practicing. And every time that happened, I would just say, ah, you know what? No big deal. The way that we're doing lessons here in this accelerated program is that even if kids only practice at the lesson, a lot of times they will move through their books faster than most kids move because of some of the things that we're doing here. And after saying that enough to a parent, they would just stop doing it. And they started believing what I was saying. And it was true. I was doing different things. And those kids, by and large, even if they never practice at home, were moving faster than those kids who I'd been teaching one-on-one -on -one privately in kind of traditional ways of teaching my first five years of teaching. They were moving faster than those kids were historically. And then just when I began to understand, well, how, how fast do kids move through this method book? And then getting that data and then saying like, oh, most of my kids are actually moving through faster than that. I could actually say that because I actually talked to some publishers and asked them, what do you see as a typical time for each of these books in your series? And I got some information about that for the series that I was teaching out of. So that's kind of how I handled it. I think it's a good way of doing it, especially again, in this age of distraction and this age of overcommitment in some ways, like overcommitment to too many activities and then undercommitment to all the activities that they're enrolled in. <laughs> Imagine being on both poles, overcommitted and undercommitted at the same time. But that's where we find ourselves in most societies these days. And uh, I think my approach really worked well for me. And I've seen it work well for a lot of other teachers, especially ones who are doing group the way that I, you know, that I was doing. Fantastic. Uh, like 30 seconds, I was going to go, oh, this is so sneaky. We're, we're getting rid of the practice expectation and we're delivering on actually getting them practicing at the same yeah. time. So you're getting yeah. both happening at the second time. And just a thought popped into my head at the same, just mm. right then at the air. And, and I thought this is something you, you may be interested in, other people may be interested in. You just said everyone's overcommitted. And I've literally just had this meeting with my staff. I keep getting, oh, we can only do this day. Kids are doing swimming Monday, football Tuesday, basketball Wednesday. And they go, we've only got one, one day left for guitar or whichever instrument they're learning. So where do they expect to fit the practice in? It's like the, they're coming to something when they already don't have time for it. So that, yeah. that's just something I'm going to, you know, take home and think about. How can I bring that up think, with parents saying, you know, you're coming to me saying you don't have time. How are you going yeah. to fit this extra thing in? But that's why the learning has to take place with us, just like it would. I always say this about swimming lessons. You don't go home and practice swimming because you don't have a pool at home, but you become a good swimming teacher, or a, a, a swimming student, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and we do yeah. this. We're doing this in the, the hope that one day when we need these skills, they're going to save our life in a you know scenario or Mm. facilitate the really great social outcome that, yeah, I can go to a pool party and feel safe because <laughs> I can swim, yeah. things like that. The same thing with music is we're doing this not with the long-term expectation that you're going to be a professional musician, but it's going to be a hobby that provides lifelong skills and enjoyment, something you touched about. There's all these transient social media, video game, dopamine hit kind of things with no real life, instant gratifying, but no real life skills. We're going to build something long-term and the expectation is whether they practice it or not, we're building towards that future opportunity and what they're going to get out of it. Yeah. One nuance I would volunteer here is that I would also begin to learn the per I think you can do this when you're running a studio like I did. Even with 100 students, I, I had a pretty good mind for who each parent was. 
And I would begin to identify parents that were actually not just harassing their kids to practice, but were actually involved in the music or for whatever reason, they had a relationship with their child where it was, you know, they laid down the law and the child did it and there weren't fights over it. I can think of families right now from 10 years ago that I knew that was true. With those parents, I would start talking to them different. I wouldn't just go to that default message. I would encourage the practice at home. I would start talking to them more intelligently or more robustly about practice expectations and what would be best and troubleshooting problems that Gabby had with this particular song. Like I'm thinking of a specific student. So that's that's the nuance. It wasn't just this flat message that I said to everyone. It was the baseline message, but then there would be nuances for people that I that I knew were in this for the long haul. You know, that's absolutely amazing. And I think everyone can learn from the fact that there's never a one size fits all approach. And especially in group lessons, you now have all these different people with various different needs and different backgrounds and different scenarios in the little melting pot that's your studio. So mm -hmm. you've got to be a little bit adaptable and malleable, 80-20 principle, but it's been great to hear all those insights. So Daniel, yeah. before we wrap this up, where can all of our listeners connect with you, find you online, learn about your school or potentially come on with, a, uh, with you as a client? Yeah, so uh, two ways, I think, to find me very easily. Uh, growyourmusicstudio.com slash free or just growyourmusicstudio.com but if you go to slash free there's a lot of free some of the best resources I've created over the last seven years the the ones that I keep getting comments on you can find them there including uh, an ebook I wrote called um, how to fill your group lesson program and you can download that ebook for free it's got some really good advice in it and then the other place you can find me is grouplessons.com this is kind of the newest project that I took on a year two years ago now and I blog there as well. So yeah, I've got a podcast. I do videos on YouTube. I've got the two blogs that I try for. I'm, I'm just busy, man. <laughs> yeah. Sounds fantastic. And to our listeners, the I'm a big proponent of guitar group lessons, of building that community around your studio. Anything that Daniel is going to be saying about group piano lessons, it, it may be group in general. It may be piano specific. Yeah. It's almost always going to be instantly transferable to guitar. I, I always, people come to me and go, can, can I teach? You, you talk about six-figure guitar teacher, can I do it with piano? Like guitar and piano, the group teaching thing, you know, in my opinion, for 80% of people works just as good, if not better than private lessons. I'm a, a big proponent of that. And uh, Daniel, although I haven't checked out uh, the vast majority of your actual resources, everything you've ever said on your podcast has been, you know, absolutely dead on, spot on. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast. I appreciate you sharing your wonderful wealth of knowledge and advice with our listeners. And uh, I'm really looking forward to a next time, which I hope there will be one. But in the meantime, oh, guys, there definitely will be. <laughs> if you tuned in, make sure you check out Daniel's staff comment. Please jump on the Top Music Guitar podcast again. And uh, I know it's been a bit like drinking from a fire hydrant at the moment. Just there's been so much coming out of it. And uh, this is going to be one of those ones which I just can't wait to you know listen to myself again. Cool. All right, Daniel. So thank you again for your time. We'll look forward to our next occasion. We'll send people you know, your way in the meantime and looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much for coming, guys. And for our listeners at home, we'll see you in the next exciting episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Until then, have a great one. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.